a modern day gamekeeper, I mean, it's not all about the grouse anymore. It's it's more about the whole thing, the hill in general, um, the welfare of not just grouse, but other birds. It's all changed and I don't think it'll ever be as it was in years gone by, where it's all just about the grouse. It's about the management of everything, you know, and ensuring that every species has its place. For me, I, I grew up in on an estate um, and you know my father was a, a gamekeeper and my family they you know they'll maybe come out with us um, you know doing you know, go out with the Land Rover and spend the afternoon doing whatever I'm doing with me. My little boy loves loves coming out to uh, see the horses we've got on the estate or feed the dogs, you know that's that's a, a real key time of the day is feeding the dogs, you know, it's the first thing he wants to do when he wakes up in the morning. You know, that in itself, you know, it's a fantastic environment to grow up in and quite a unique one and it is, you know, it's a perfect life, you know, it's, you're out in the fresh air, there's loads of things to explore for the kids. The time that not just myself, but any keeper can give his family is limited. So it does put a hell of a strain on relationships and families and you know, I mean, I know myself, I would like to give a lot more time to my family. You know, you give as much as you can, but uh, it would be nice to give more time to your family. You have to have an understanding wife and get around it the best way you can. Well, the choice is, I mean, when you're out here all day, every day, and you see the things we see, I mean, the amount of species, and to be part of that and know that you're helping that along, I mean, it, it, that keeps you going, you know, every, you know, every day. It's enjoyment, like I say, it's not money. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of time. It does put a lot of pressure on your marriage at times. I don't think people realise how difficult it is, the amount of hours that people put in. And obviously you've got a lot of health and safety risks as well at the back of it. People don't realise how dangerous it can be out there. And, but it's just a way of life. And just it's a passion and obviously you want to see things progress and, and keep, keep moving forward. Before, before I came here, in a, in not the last job but one, uh, I actually worked for the Game Conservancy on the Otterburn project, which is, um, it was basically to show how uh, modern day grouse keepers promote all other ground nesting birds as well as everything else, really. Um, so we, you, the spin-off from the, our work, you know, our burning, um, the predator control, you know, all these ground nesting birds, these other prey species, they just flourish. You know, in the last 10 to 10, 12 years, the, the keeper in Glen Ogles has intensified, the wader population has exploded. Yeah. Also, we have black game, the black game of, you know, I can think on the area we've, we have now, we look after now, um, there was maybe six leks, now there's a dozen, easily, and with a few other satellites, uh, leks around them as well. There's no such thing as a wild landscape and a heather moorland as you see, like today, I mean, it's been managed like this for hundreds of years. What, what we want to create is lots of little environments all over the moorland. There might be like a, a bog flush in the middle of it, so you want you want to, to, to sort of use that bog flush, which will be full of insects for the grouse. You'll have long heather, a sort of mid, mid height heather, and a fresh burn. So you've created four habitats in that one little acre. So anything that's living there doesn't really have to travel very far to, to get what it wants. It's got water, it's got insects, it's got shelter, and it's got a nice nice bit of feeding. If we didn't control the vermin, the stoats, the weasels, the foxes that eat not just um, the adult birds, but they're eating eggs, um, they're eating chicks in the springtime, you know, so um, if we didn't control those, the, the amount of species that you would see would decline rapidly. From sort of mid-April through to you know, right the way through summer, you know, it's fox control, you know, foxes are, are uh, do a, a hell of a lot of damage at that time of year. Um, you know, one fox in 
in a square kilometre could completely wipe out um, all of the, the ground nesting birds, you know, or, or virtually all of them. So, you know, we want to keep the density right down so that the ground nesting birds have a chance to, to rear their young and, and come away with them. Um, at, at that time as well, you know, again, uh, crows, corvid control, that's really important for, for uh, carrying crows, raiding, raiding nests or, or scooping up young chicks, so that, that's a real focus on sort of late spring, early summer. These days, I mean, everything's moving on and uh, with legislation and the law, we have to abide by the law for controlling vermin. I mean, we use snares for fox control, but um, nowadays everything's licensed with snares. We have to be, we have to attend courses. We are registered. Each keeper has his own individual number and he has to have a number on a snare. So it's all regulated that way. I mean, that's for foxes. We're also trapping stoats and weasels. We use fen traps. Um, but the way we use those, it's all, um, again, it's all legislation. We're only allowed to use um, legal traps. They have to be run legally. You know, you see, probably seen some footage on the film of the rail traps, they all have to be covered, so non-target species can't enter into those. Um, you know, so there's lots of ways of vermin control and, again, shooting as well. I mean, we, we use quite a few methods. There's around about 60 different species of birds here, and, you know, what, what we do, um, by managing the moor for red grouse. On the actual moor itself, um, we've got loads and loads of white hares. So that provides a good food source for gold meagles. Um, you know, the, the, the waders on the moorland fringes, they, you know, this is where they come to, to nest. So they, they spend the sort of the winter time on the coasts and where there's very little predation co control done. So this is where they come, they nest here. If, if we weren't controlling the predators here and they, they weren't able to, to nest successfully, you know, the, the, the numbers would just dwindle, you know, over a couple of years, there would be next to nothing. You know, this year we had uh, one successful nest of eagles, the other nest failed due to the cold spring. Um, there's merlins, there's peregrines, you know, we, we see an os osprey regular in the loch here. Um, you know, there's buzzards, there's, there's sparhawks. You know, they, they all they all live here. You know, you know, a lot of the organisations out there. You know, the, there's a real negative negativity about grouse moors in the shooting industry. They don't want to to come out and say, actually, they're they're very good and the raptors do live there, um, which is actually more the case. Uh, you know, the, we had uh, two years ago, we had, a, we had two golden eagle nests. One, one had a single chick in it and the other had three, three eaglets in it, which is very rare. And that, I, I don't believe for one minute if, if that was on the west coast where the, there's not the food that there is here, you know, that three eaglets would have almost certainly died. And, you know, they, they, may, have, they may have raised one chick, but, you know, that was a, a real you know, a real success story that the fact is there, there's so many white hares here and there's loads of grouse, there's loads of waders, there's lots of rabbits, and it's, it's all down to the management and predation control that we do. When people think of a gamekeeper in the Angus Glens, they, they, they don't realise the sort of the backup that we have. There's a huge amount of employment on these, on especially this estate, other than gamekeepers. Although, you know, there's, there's 12 gamekeepers working here at Glen Ogle. We also have a, w a woman that works in the office that sort of keeps everything moving, you know, all the paperwork, the admin, wages, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, but we also have like house manager for the big house. Uh, we have property a property manager. He looks after all the keepers' properties uh, and all the other houses on the estate. But then we have two groundsmen. Uh, we have a chef. We have. Uh, there's a cleaner that does all the sort of the, the owner's house, but also the, the holiday lets on the estate. Um, we all there's, there's part-time staff during the shooting season. You know, girls um, doing waitressing for the shoot parties uh, during the day and at night. Um, but there, there's also a lot of spin-off employment as well. You know, all the contractors that we use. Um, we obviously use the local garages to 
fix our vehicles. We use a local blacksmith to fix things that we broke on a regular basis. You know, this estate it supports um, nine full-time staff, sorry, 10 full-time staff. So if, if the grouse shooting wasn't here, and say this was just a, 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 an estate where it just offered deer stocking, they would probably, that, that 10 would almost certainly drop to four uh, as a, at a maximum, I would suggest, you know, just because it's just not viable. It doesn't take so many people to, to, to do it. And, uh, you know, everything would, would, would sort of change, you know, in the area. The school would, would be under real pressure to shut. You know, there's, there's local businesses would maybe suffer, you know. This is a beautiful place to live, but in reality, it, you wouldn't commute to, to the likes of Aberdeen or Dundee, which is 50 miles away, because, you know, it's just not economical. You know, you in the winter time, you might get six inches of snow in an hour, and the, all of a sudden the road's shut, so you might not get to work. And it, it just it just wouldn't work. And what what would generally happen, I think, would be that the the, the staff houses would probably go up for sale, and people from the central belt or the south of England snap them up for a, a second home or a holiday home, and then you know the, the whole area would just. It would it would suffer because there would be the, the local the local community would, would disappear. You would you would have you know just a, a heap of people that would maybe be here for a few weeks in a year, and, and that would be a real loss. Well, the majority of the children that go to the school are keepers and farmers' children. So if you didn't have them in the community, then there wouldn't be a school there. There wouldn't be local employment. You wouldn't have an up-and-coming um, children uh, working in the countryside, and you would lose the way of, way of life really for a lot of practices. When the recession hit, Glen Ogle carried on employing local tradesmen because we were doing a, doing up and renovating all the houses. You know, and that's not just the local joiners and builders. All the, all the materials we buy through Travis Perkins, uh, Harbro, which is a sort of Scottish company. Um, there's a huge amount of stuff. Everything goes into the local community. What we do is before the season, I mean, it's usually um, sort of the latter end of July when the grouse are big enough to fly, we do something called grouse counts and in the, it, each and on the hill, each each bit of the hill is split up into different beats and different drives um, that we use and the lads will go out and count each drive. Now by counting, um, they'll use dogs to flush the grouse and you count brood sizes so you'll count the adults and how many chicks. And you know, there's records of these counts over the years and so each year you get a different record and it gives you a rough idea, you know, of, of sort of your, your grouse population and how many days you can shoot, you know, and how many you're going to shoot, it gives you a rough idea anyway. These hills have been shot for a long, long time, um, you know, and the whole management side of it has, has been practiced for a long time, and you get a feel for the stocking levels of the grouse and how many you need to leave for a decent stock for next year. Some years, you know, are better than others. We're not looking for massive bags of grouse, you know, we just want a sustainable, a, a sustainable shoot where we can come and have you know some day shooting every year you know and just do that like i say we're not we're not looking for to kill thousands of grouse you know it's just it's all about the management of it and just keeping the thing going with driven grouse shooting you bring a huge amount of employment not just the full-time employment it's the 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 uh the casual employment as well you know the beaters the flankers the loaders we'll use We'll cater for maybe 70 to 80 extra people on a shoot day um, because we provide the lunch for all the sort of shooting staff. What we do is, um, you know, we've got six dog handlers on the shoot day. So it's, it's very important that, you know, they pick as many of the grouse as, as, as physically possible. So they, they, they've got really good, well-trained dogs to pick them 
the keepers help with their dogs to pick them. Um, the guns are briefed in the morning that they're not allowed to leave their butt until all their grouse are picked. So that you know that's a very important thing. There's, there's no point in killing something if it's not going to end up somewhere. So what happens with the grouse once they're, they're taken off the hill? They go down to the larder and they'll, they'll sit chilled. Now the grouse end up in two sort of three places. The first place that the grouse are likely to end up is, is away with the game dealer. So the game dealer will come up the next day, take all the shot, shot grouse away that we want them to, to take um, and they'll go into the, the food chain, European market or the restaurants down south. The other two places the grouse tend to end up, almost certainly the people that come to shoot want to take grouse home with them. So they will, they will physically will, will box up some grouse for them and they'll, they'll take them away. But at the same time, they also want to eat them when they're here. So if they're here for a couple of nights, one of the things that will be on the menu for that couple of nights will be red grouse. So the, the, you know, one of the things that everyone wants to do when, the, when they're on the hill is take something home and eat it because it, it's, it's sort of nature's the way man is, they want to go out and hunt for themselves, that's natural. And everyone that comes wants to, to, to sample the meat that they've, they've, they've killed and taken home. You know, Angus, 10 years ago, was, um, was in decline. There was gamekeepers being paid off left, right and centre. The, the rejuvenation of the Angus Glens has solely been because of wealthy landowners with a vision to bring grouse numbers back to the Angus Glens. Without the wealthy landowners, without the boots on the ground, without the gamekeepers, then the wildlife, the waders, the raptors will decline in numbers because there will not be a, a food source to keep the amount of these birds that are in the glens at the moment alive. So I think if we're looking to a conclusion to this, I think if driven grouse shooting in these rural areas was to cease, that it would be extremely detrimental to the people and the wildlife in the glens. And, uh, and I hope that I, I never see that day.